In this video, we're going to explore the price to earnings ratio, aka price to earnings multiple. This is one of the most popular investor ratios and is calculated by simply taking the price of a stock P and dividing it by the earnings per share uh, or EPS. The PE ratio shows you the price that you pay for a stock relative to its earnings per share. So it's showing you how much you're paying for every dollar of profit the firm earns. Now, if we think about the EPS, in its simplest form, it's calculated by taking the net income of the firm and dividing it by the number of shares. That's literally it. Now, of course, because accountants love jargon, there's a good few terms for net income, and it's important that you know that all of these mean exactly the same thing. So whether you call it net profit or profit after tax or earnings or you know profit in general, we're referring to the net profit or the net income of a firm. Now, given that the EPS is the net income divided by the number of shares, it actually allows us to express the PE ratio uh, in a slightly different way. So we could express the PE as the market capitalization relative to the net income. In other words, we could say that the price to earnings ratio PE is equal to the market capitalization divided by the net income. Why is that the case? Well, if you'll recall, we said that the price to earnings ratio PE is equal to the price divided by the EPS. Now, given that the earnings per share EPS is equal to the net income divided by the number of shares, I can rewrite this equation like so, right? So the price to earnings ratio is equal to the price divided by net income divided by the number of shares, because net income over the number of shares is nothing but the EPS. Now, if we look at this equation here, then we can see this not as price divided by net income over number of shares, but as price divided by one divided by the net income divided by number of shares. And if we see it that way, then we have a upper fraction divided by a lower fraction. And so what you can do is flip the lower fraction uh, and multiply it by the upper fraction. So essentially that would look like this. So you'd have the price to earnings ratio is equal to P over one, which would be the upper fraction multiplied by the lower fraction flipped, right? So that's the number of shares divided by the net income, which is nothing but the net income over number of shares flipped. And so now we can then rewrite this equation as the price P multiplied by the number of shares divided by the net income, because you know that's just price multiplied by the number of shares. And then the denominator is one multiplied by the net income, which is nothing but the net income because of course anything multiplied by one is equal to itself. And what is the price multiplied by the number of shares? Well, it's nothing but the market capitalization, right? So we can say that the price to earnings ratio is either P over EPS or the market capitalization divided by the net income. They'll both give you exactly the same result. Perhaps more importantly though, the way we interpret the PE is that it shows you how much you pay for every $1 of profit the firm earns. And this interpretation holds regardless of whether you take the market cap over the net income approach or the price divided by the EPS approach to measuring the PE. Now, given that it shows you how much you pay for every $1 of profit the firm earns, some people argue that the PE is a measure of payback. They argue it shows you how long it will take for you to make back your initial investment. But we would argue that it's actually more a proxy for a firm's growth prospects. And we're certainly not alone uh, in this interpretation. And if you accept that it can be a proxy for a firm's growth opportunities, uh, then it can also be argued uh, or seen as a proxy for risk. And to see what we mean by this, let's consider an example. So consider a firm whose stock price is currently $100 and whose EPS is $5. With this data in mind, the firm's price to earnings ratio would equate to 20, because recall that the PE is simply the price divided by the EPS. So we would take $100 as the price and divide that by the EPS of $5 to get a price to earnings ratio of 20. Assuming the firm's profits remain constant and that it pays all of its profits as dividends every single year, it would take 20 years for you to make back your $100 investment. This is the payback period interpretation of the PE ratio. Of course, for this to be true, we would also need to assume that the stock price remains unchanged for 20 years, something which is practically impossible. And this is why we don't really see the price to earnings ratio 
uh, as a measure for the payback period. The fact that investors are willing to pay 20 times the current earnings must mean that they expect the firm's value to grow or to increase by substantially more uh, than what they're paying. So investors are either expecting the earnings of the firm to grow or they're expecting the value of the firm to increase uh, or indeed both because an increase in the value and or the earnings would allow investors to make back their money in less than 20 years. That is the only way in which they would be able to make it back uh, faster. And this obviously means that investors are essentially betting on the firm's future prospects, meaning while growth is possible, it certainly does involve some level of risk because we're dealing with the future and the future is obviously not guaranteed. So if you were to see the price to earnings as a proxy for growth and risk, then we can say that firms that have high PE ratios tend to have high growth prospects and also carry a high level of risk. And on the other end of the spectrum, you have firms that have low PE ratios, whose growth prospects are possibly low and whose risk levels are relatively low. Now, importantly, by no means is this universally true because of course you can have high growth firms that have low PE ratios and you can have low growth firms that have high PE ratios. And as we go along in the course, we'll see plenty of real life examples uh, where this is the case. And of course, we'll also see examples where the high PE, high growth, high risk uh, also kind of make sense. But what you do need to know, and indeed bear in mind, is that there is an alternative uh, risk growth interpretation, which is that growth firms are less risky compared to non-growth firms. So if we see the PE as a proxy for growth and risk, we're saying that firms that have high PE ratios likely have high growth prospects and also have a high level of risk. So essentially we're saying high growth firms or firms with high growth prospects are, are highly risky. But the alternative interpretation um, is that high growth firms are actually less risky compared to low growth or non-growth firms. And the intuition here is that firms that do not grow must ultimately go bust. They must ultimately uh, become insolvent or dissolve. And this of course is relying on the notion that if you don't grow, then your competition is gonna come in and take your business away. And ultimately, you know, the trickle down effect is that you end up um, filing for bankruptcy. Ultimately though, while we might argue about which risk versus growth interpretation is more correct, I hope that we can all agree that the um, risk and growth interpretation of the PE is a better interpretation relative to the um, payback period interpretation. All right, in summary then, we learned that the price to earnings ratio shows you how much you pay for every dollar of profit that the firm earns. We saw that it's calculated uh, by taking the price of a stock P and dividing it by the EPS or the earnings per share. And of course, we said that the PE can be seen as a proxy for a firm's growth prospects and risk, although this is of course not universally true. All right, that's enough for me for now. Have a go at the quiz and I'll see you in the next video.